Hey guys, welcome to video number two of the design process series. This video is going to cover uh, initial concept, inspiration, sketchbook development, and mood boards. It is a just disgusting, gray, rainy, drizzly, crappy day outside. I am having a bad hair day. I am slightly over caffeinated. Yeah, let's get started, Whew, right? Because you know what? Not every day is gonna be an ideal condition to work, but sometimes you just gotta work through the pain. Mm. Why even bother with a mood board? There is a difference between dressmakers and designers. And I'm not trying to put down dressmakers, but dressmakers make dresses and uh, that is what they're good at. They're good at sewing. They're good at problem solving. They're good at putting things together with their hands. Fashion designers, yeah, they need to know how to make clothes. Like I have no respect for fashion designers who don't know how to sew. They don't have to be the best at it, but when I see a, a designer sitting in a fitting and they don't actually know the basics of pattern making or sewing, I lose whatever respect I had for them. However, fashion designers are really about developing a story and sharing a unique point of view. And that is what makes us special. That is what makes us stand out from the next designer is this unique point of view. The most successful brands have a distinct origin story and sort of brand point of view that we can relate to. Okay? Some of us love couture origin stories. They love the history of Coco Chanel, how she got started and how she was into comfort stretch fabrics and the little black dress and modern dressing. Some of us think couture is dead, long live couture and are more modern and fresh and all about fiber technology and you know the future, 3D printing, all that stuff. But whatever your point of view is, share that with us. Okay. And so we start with our concept and our mood board so that we can create a story every season that aligns with our point of view, that pushes our point of view further, shares interesting stories, just makes everything more interesting, right? So start by choosing a concept and it doesn't make you a lesser designer if you don't have a concept right off the bat. Inspiration doesn't work on a clock, on a schedule. It's not like, oh, hey, brain, it's March 1st, think of something, okay? Because I need to work on a new project now, so no, it doesn't really work like that. So if you can't think of anything, get out there. Again, get off the internet. Go read a book or go look at pretty picture books. Go look at some magazines. Go look at things that don't have anything to do with fashion. Okay. Go to an art gallery or a museum, pick up some of those little postcards of really nice photos of the art. Go to a, go to a library. I saw this awesome, like there's this internet meme going around and it's like libraries, the last place where they like you more than they like your wallet. I'm like, oh, that's so true. So true. Go walk around outside in the sunshine. Obviously not today. It is just gross. Don't go out there. It's, it's horrible. Hey, look. Go hiking. Think about the last time you traveled someplace cool or think about the place that you want to travel to as soon as the semester is over. Those of you who follow me on Instagram or Twitter know that I am seriously obsessed with two things right now. This book called Extraordinary Chickens, you guys. It's called Extraordinary Chickens. And I posted this on Facebook and one of my girlfriends was like, hey, did you know that there's a companion book called Extraordinary Pigeons? <laughs> And it's this awesome book and it just shows just completely insane but amazing photographs of, of chickens and different kinds of chickens and crests and combs and scaly claws and beaks and really scary eyeballs. Like chickens want to kill you. Like they are the ultimate queens of resting bitch face. I also picked up this magazine called As If. What I love about this magazine is it's not just a fashion magazine. It's very fashion centric, but there is art. There are other stories that involve nature and the world and dance. In lieu of saying, hey, I'm gonna pursue this as a concept, I started with these two books. I scanned and I printed some of the images from my chicken's book that called to me the most, like these claws. These almost oily looking black feathers that are iridescent, these chicken eggs, 
more scale. Okay, more cool colors. And then I was looking in the magazine and I wasn't looking for, you know, cool fashion to be inspired off of. Like, you know, I don't think that it's a good idea to be inspired by other people's clothes because then you're just kind of rehashing other people's clothes. And I know that, you know, when a designer takes over a brand from another designer, that they still have to reflect back on the archives and make sure that there's a sense of the brand's history that is retained in each of the future collections. Like you would never see a Chanel collection where Karl Lagerfeld didn't include a little black dress or some tweed. But at the same time, you know, that's reflecting on the brand's history, but not necessarily following line for line or rehashing. And if you are not designing for a different brand, you definitely have no excuse. Okay? But I do love looking at editorials when they're really good at capturing a particular mood. And when I was looking at this editorial, I really love the crazy neon lighting and the blurring and just how incredibly dirty and sleazy and dark and drug addled these images looked. I really love this kind of spoiled little rich girl, um, princess in a tower, unhappy, sort of glamorous sort of thing. And, and then they had this spread on graffiti and I was enamored with the visual textures and the colors that were pulsating. <laughs> I sound like kind of like a bimbo when I say this, but I didn't actually read any of the articles. And uh, I actually have no context for these images. None whatsoever. Did not read a single word, but I pulled these images because I thought that the textures were so awesome. Like, look at this. And these textures and colors in here. I started getting into this sort of, you know, repetition with irregularity sort of concept where you have all of these emeralds and they're obviously all the same thing, but they're all slightly different from each other. And here too, all these uh, tiers of rock and the textures emeralds in the raw all of these photos that this is one gigantic photo that has been printed and cut and allowed to decay and curl and pin together so i noticed myself pulling things that show an irregular repetition and i got really excited about that and so i went to my own personal library and i pulled two books one on snowflakes. That's right. I have a whole book on snowflakes. Mm. So I started pulling my favorite ones and you're not beholden to print everything and use images as you find them. Okay. So I did this one in black and white. I stretched this one out. I blew this one up and changed the colors. And then I pulled a book on handmade African textiles. You know, when anything is handmade, there is a beautiful kind of organic irregularity to whatever is being done, whether it's pottery or weavings or paintings. And I love that. And so I pulled these where they have cool textures, cool fabric stories. And I love these colors. It's colorful, but earthy. So yeah, chicken feathers. Irregular repetition and a sad, dirty, greasy, beautiful, glamorous mood. So I'm putting these things together. It is okay to pick two or three things as part of your concepts and kind of merge them together because your unique way of combining these things will help you form your own look. You know, I could give these exact stack of images to a class of 20 students and each student would come away with a different project because we all have, you know, different things that appeal to us, different things that we don't like and different ways of interpreting what we see. So go ahead and pick a few things. I would recommend that you 
not get too crazy and start picking five, six things because you do want to retain a sense of cohesiveness, like a theme throughout your collection, whether it's eight outfits or 18 outfits or 80 outfits, you still want there to be a common thread throughout. So don't get too all over the place. I would recommend, especially if you're new to designing, I would recommend that you stay away from concepts that are more like academic ideas or things that don't have a tangible presence. I know a mood can have, is not really a tangible presence, but at the same time, I have the mood plus the irregular repetition kind of combined together to create my inspiration. But if you have a concept where you start with emotion, where do you go with that? And you might have to travel a really long way with this initial concept before you start getting something tangible and visible. You know, that can really work for some people. We all have different ways of thinking. But I find with students that it is harder to start out with something that you really can't visualize immediately. So, you know, be kind to yourself. I tell my students all the time, learn how to walk before you run. And so start with something that is easier to grasp. And then the next subsequent projects, you can kind of roll around with something a little more esoteric. Sometimes you will be given a design brief, especially if you're at school, or sometimes your creative director will tell you what you need to be researching. And sometimes you will be kind of stuck. And so you'll just, you know, think of something but not really know where to take it. And in those situations, I like to do a mind map. So I'm going to Japan later this year. You know, that can kind of be a starting point for your project a place you want to go, a place you're going to go, a place you've just been. And you can take that as your foundation for brainstorming. Brainstorming is basically just you write down every single idea that comes to your head and you don't try to analyze it and think, oh, that's a good idea. That's a bad idea. Okay? Just let the concepts flow and just write them all down. And then later you could start editing and pick a path that you think is the most interesting. So what are some things about Japan, about any country? You know, we could think about the architecture. We could think about the food. We could think about pop culture. You know, Japan has weird sex culture. Japan has awesome traditions, their tea ceremonies, their history of samurai, um, you know, their traditional kimono. Although, honestly, I recommend that you stay away from trying to be inspired by a country or tribe's traditional dress. It's one thing to look at something and be inspired. Like, let's say if we're looking at Japanese kimono, it's one thing to be inspired by complicated layering or boxy shapes or, you know, intense nature motifs or the decorative techniques that the Japanese used on their kimono. But you don't want your collection to look like a bunch of modern kimono, right? Like if someone talked about it, they could see, oh, I can see how you're inspired by kimono, but you don't want them to look just like, oh, it's kind of just some cheap kimono knockoff, right? You don't want it to look costume. You still want it to look fashion. They have a whole tradition of kabuki, geishas, cherry blossoms, kind of nature in general. Okay, we're going to put that together. We have Mount Fuji, other nature scenes, other flowers. We could talk in food. We could talk about sushi. We could talk about food presentation being a huge deal in Japanese culture, which makes me think of flower display and arrangement, which is a big deal in Japan. Pop culture, we can think about the music, urban parks. You could start thinking about their traditional art. You can go all over the place, but just write everything down because you know what? I don't care if you've led a squeaky clean life and never done a drug in your life. Your memory is not as good as you think it is. So start exploring and start meandering and start making connections and you will end up kind of in a corner 
of your mind map that you find the most interesting. And that's when you can start going to the library, doing your research, going to look at, you know, photographs of cherry blossom season just outside of Tokyo, where everything is pink and frothy and beautiful with the spring sunshine and, you know, just completely breathtaking, right? I'm a little bit sad that I can't go to Japan in the spring, but whatever, I'm going to Japan in the summer and that's, that's really good enough. Mm. At this stage, I would start collaging my images and this is the next step towards doing mood boards. What I would do is I would start putting together things in a sketchbook and then I would take the best parts of my sketchbook and what I felt were the most important, most inspiring sections. And I would pull those and put them together for a mood board if I needed to do a really nice mood board presentation for my portfolio. On a side note though, I do love looking at process, whether I'm a teacher or whether I'm a designer hiring someone to work with me. Uh, I love the progress, the process books because I love to see how a designer thinks. So don't throw any of this stuff away. Number one, don't just start collaging after you've collected all your images. If you just spend in a whole week or two pulling images, by the time you actually get to collaging, you're probably going to forget some of the reasons why you initially pulled certain images. Like I said, our memories not as good as you think they are. So you can take notes, you can write stickies on them, but really the best thing to do would be to collage, put things together, get inspired by the combinations that you put together, and then let that take you onto a new offshoot of your visual research. This is the book I'm using, and I like a spiral bound because I find it much easier to open than a book that's bound like an actual book. Book that's bound like an actual book. Okay, I'm gonna go read a thesaurus over the weekend. I will be right back. And I like this paper. This is mixed media paper. And so it, each page is sturdy enough where it can handle a little bit of painting and some glue and a few layers and things like that. Not that I'm going to sit here and do full on watercolor paintings, but I want paper that can handle at least some of that. Today, I'm just going to use the magazine images that I pulled from As If Magazine, that magazine I showed you earlier, but you don't need to. I would encourage you guys to scan in images and reprint them out in a variety of different ways. I would recommend you print them out black and white. You can recolorize them. You can shrink them down and print them up really small and maybe repeat it into a pattern, you know, tile them up in Photoshop, or you could just print them really small and or in different sizes and print out multiples and then collage them all repeated. You can you know, take something like this and blow it up. The original image was like this big. And so I scanned it into Photoshop at 600 DPI and I printed this out really big because I wanted to see all the details of the scales. You can take them into Photoshop and deliberately pixelate them if you want to create more of a fuzz, a mood, a vague sort of suggestion of something as opposed to a really crisp description of something. Sometimes I create a window tool. I take a piece of paper and I cut a square out of the middle of it and this can be as big or as small as you want it and sometimes when I am confronted with a really busy image like this I will take my window tool so that I can examine things section by section without being overwhelmed by everything that's going on. And sometimes as I move my window tool around, I will find a particular section, a proportion of color, a small detail that I didn't notice because I was kind of overwhelmed by how much that was going on. When I see something like this, I can use my window tool to recrop images. Like maybe I like how heavy and black this is with only a little bit of the veiny branches. Or maybe that is really what I was going after, the light coming through where the branches are becoming the thinnest. And so I start moving this around and start building compositions. And if I come across something that I like, 
I will take a pencil and I will mark the corners of my composition and then cut it out. Start cutting your images. And again, just because you printed something out a certain way doesn't mean you have to use that whole image. Like, I love this, but I don't want this. So feel free to edit and cut into shapes that you want, not necessarily using each image exactly the way it is shown on the page, okay? That's what, if you're afraid of cutting up the original, that's what copy machines and scanners are for, hey yo. If you want to cut things out really precisely in perfect right angles and such, you can use an X-Acto blade and a cutting mat just a little word of advice, if you are gonna use an X-Acto blade, I highly recommend that you use a metal ruler with a rubber or cork back because these are the kinds of rulers that won't move around when you press a blade to it. You don't even need to use anything. Sometimes I like to rip things out because I love using the ripped edge as part of the aesthetic. Work slowly so that you're not accidentally cutting into your image. You know, you could do all kinds of things. You can use tape in a rough way to add things. It's all about, you know, the presentation and maybe you want a rougher presentation. Feel free to draw things and paint things right on top of your images. You know, and it is totally okay if the first things that you paint and draw are not awesome. At this stage, the only really bad thing that you could do is to not explore, is to not play around and let your brain just flow and come up with interesting overlaps. And then sometimes I like to take a bit of tracing paper and pull elements that I really want to explore. To be quite honest, I could do this all day and just pull images and layer things and collage things and paint on top, scribble on top, whether I use tracing paper or not use gloss varnish to highlight some things, use the window tool on a multitude of images and scan and blow up sections, pull textures, write scribble little notes to self. Feel free to add other things, ticket stubs, little pom-pom balls, actual feathers, um, bits of fur, smears of lipstick, I would recommend staying away from actual fabric or things that you plan on making these things out of. We're not really there yet, but just exploring, you know, different visual themes. And remind yourself, don't be so literal. Just because I started with chicken feathers doesn't mean that my designs later on the road are going to feature feathers or fur or chickens or any of that. It was a starting point for my brain to get going. And so when you look at the final collection later on, you might not find anything that's reminiscent of anything vaguely chicken-like, and that's okay. okay. This is not about, hey, find a way to incorporate feathers, you know, unless your creative director says, hey, you gotta find a way to incorporate feathers. Unless that's the case, it's really about finding a jumping point for further exploration. And do it again, you know, I can do like a dozen pages of this before I start thinking about which colors I'm gonna pull from my color story and which textures that I like enough to translate further into things that I'm actually going to make. Keep working, pull away from things that are not working. You don't have to scratch things out and I don't want you to get rid of anything. Just keep everything in your sketchbook, but you are going to gravitate towards certain things and you're gonna find things that didn't really work out for you and that's fine and you just keep developing and making these connections and making these cool new 
combinations and keep progressing and building better and better visual development pages. Just make sure that you kind of stay in line with your original concept, the feathers as texture, the repetitive elements, the mood of the kind of dirty, greasy, sad mood I have going on. That is turning quite maudlin, to be honest. Whew. Yeah, this is a cheerful project. And then when you are happy with your research and you start putting together your color story, then you can pull the best segments from your sketchbook and you can make it into a clean final presentation mood board. Make sure that you are cataloging where you're getting all your images. You know, write down the info on the book, write down which museums you went to, all that good stuff so that if you need to go back and get more images, you have the that reference. Or you can make color copies of everything before you get started, although that's kind of an expensive habit to get into. Pull these and you later on you decide, I really love this, I'm going to clean this part up and maybe do the painting part better, but I wanna incorporate this as part of my final mood board, then you have an extra image of this clotted fabric for your final mood board. This is the final mood board that I created for the project that I showed you in the last video. And there are a lot of different ways that you can do mood boards, but the things I want to point out are, number one, the cohesiveness. When you look at it, just at first glance, you know that there's a theme. And the theme is furnitures and interiors. Everything is interiors and furniture. And then you see me pulling textures and patterns from everything. And you see my love of metallics by punching out silver and gold and painting over them and pulling out certain chaotic elements and really focusing on the most luxurious of furniture and interiors. Okay, When you look at your mood board, Okay. There should be a sense of cohesiveness to it so that when you, someone just looks at it, they just get a gut feeling of what it's all about. And if it's a, if you're going in too many directions and it's too chaotic and you're not getting that punch gut feeling of what the project is about, your mood board's wrong. Okay. So what I recommend would be to put your images together, don't glue anything down yet, and have someone take a look. They don't necessarily have to be someone who is super well-versed in fashion, but you should pull someone over and be like, what do you think my project is about? And if they're like, uh, I can't tell, maybe you went too many different directions on your mood board. But if they say, uh... It looks like you're inspired by like cool black and white photography um, and like rock and roll shit, you know? And even if they're not super eloquent or anything, if they can get a feel for it, what direction you were taking your project, good job, good job. So th those are all the things that I could think about to cover for your initial concept exploration and mood board development. If you have any specific questions, of course, feel free to drop me a comment below. The next video in this series will cover creating color stories and developing textures as we head towards pulling fabrics. Okay, I will see you next time.